pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Say you're running and you think, man this hurts, I can't take it anymore. The hurt part is an unavoidable reality, but whether or not you can stand anymore is up to the runner himself. Haruki Murakami If there's one thing we all have in common is that we want to be happy. But more often than not, we pin our happiness to people, circumstances and things. We attach ourselves to feelings as if they define us, and ironically, not just positive ones. And when something changes or gets lost, we melt into grief. But if you've bellowed in regret or disappointment long enough, it can seem safe and even comforting to suffer. Your inability to avoid change may make you angry, sad and frustrated. It can be hard to let go of the false belief that the only way to achieve happiness again is to regain what's been lost. Even when you know you can't reverse the situation, you may agonize over this reality. By trying to hold on to what's familiar, you limit your ability to experience joy in the present, and a moment can't possibly radiate fully when you're suffocating it in fear. But when you stop trying to grasp, own and control the world around you, you give it the freedom to fulfill you without the power to destroy you. How much happier would you be if you could just learn to let go? I teach suffering, its origin, cessation and path. That's all I teach, declares Siddhartha Gautama, known as the Buddha and the founder of the world religion Buddhism 2500 years ago. The Four Noble Truths contain the essence of his teachings, which spark awareness and understanding of suffering as the nature of existence, its cause and how to live without it. The First Noble Truth All beings experience pain and misery during their lifetime. In Buddhism there is a clear distinction between pain and suffering, and it all starts with your narrative. Pain is seen as an unavoidable part of the natural world, woven into our existence as night is with day. But suffering is different from pain, because it's caused by our reaction to the inevitable pain of life. In other words, pain is a natural response, suffering is a mental fixation. Imagine if you broke your leg after crushing your bike. If you are in pain, you observe, my leg hurts. But if you're suffering, you think, I'll never walk the same way again. Pain focuses on the event, suffering is rooted in the experience and can include anxiety, depression, fear, confusion, grief and even anger. Experiencing pain is the epitome of being present. You cannot feel the pain of yesterday or tomorrow, only today, and that's a good thing. Pain means your nerves are tingling, you're in the moment, you're alive. But suffering is dwelling on everything except the present. Only through suffering are we able to compress decades of pain into a single moment. Are you still tormented over that breakup that happened 5 years ago? Or that injury 10 years ago? The pain is long gone, but you are still able to suffer. As you can see, our capacity to suffer is far worse than experiencing pain. We are subject to desires and cravings, and experience a continuous ebb and flow of pleasure and pain, gain and loss. But even when we're able to satisfy these desires, the satisfaction is only temporary. Pleasure does not last, or if it does, it becomes monotonous. Even when we're not suffering from outward causes like illness or loss, we are unfulfilled, unsatisfied. This is the truth of suffering. As humans, we feel more secure when we have a sense of predictability in our lives. We therefore develop a great capacity for denying a simple truth. Life is not ideal, nothing ever stays the same. Even if we do everything right and exercise every precaution, we can still face change or unexpected loss. But instead of understanding and working with the inevitability of change, we resort to a fear-based behavior, trying to take control and force other people in situations to conform to our expectations. The first noble truth of Buddhism is a reminder not to slip into the avoidance behavior of denial. While it's not wise to create gloomy thoughts about how matters might take a turn for the worse, consciously ignoring the reality that all situations transform sets you up for a great shock when that time comes. Instead, embrace uncertainty, because when nothing is certain, everything is possible. To embrace uncertainty, what you need to realize is that you can control everything. In fact, in such a complex world like ours, we really have very little control. There is only one thing we can control. And that is our attitude, which may sound similar to the philosophy of Stoicism. Stoics believe that we are only in control of our own actions and responses towards the outer world. The second step to letting go is coming to a greater awareness and understanding that suffering is rooted in attachments and expectations. 
Grasping gives birth to aversion and delusion, and from there arises jealousy, anxiety, hatred, addiction, possessiveness and shamelessness, the causes of our individual and global suffering. Clinging to what once was, avoiding the process of grief and acceptance, ultimately causes paralysis. Grasping for a future set of circumstances identical to the past holds you back from discovering what better roads lie ahead, outside of your sight. The desire to backtrack or reconstruct will likely result in you walking around in circles, lost in the dark woods instead of peering around corners to find new paths. All our attachments originate from the ego, a false belief in a separate self. However, saying that the self is unreal is not the same as saying you don't exist, which is a common misconception. You do exist, but not in the way you think you do. The Buddha taught that the ultimate cause of our unhappiness and dissatisfaction with life is that we don't know who we really are. We think there's a self, which is something inside our skin, and what's out there is everything else. But according to the Buddha, this is an illusion that keeps us trapped in samsara, an endless cycle of death and rebirth. A giant spoked wheel, constantly turning with ignorance, craving and aversion, condemning us to spin round and around on this wheel of becoming, dying only to be reborn in the same suffering state eternally. But what does attachment look like in everyday life? You've built your ego through years of conditioning. It is who you believe yourself to be, and it is also what separates yourself from all other things and people. When you're attached to your ego, you're attached to how you see yourself to be and when reality doesn't match up to that image, your attachment causes you to suffer. But how can you tell if you're attached? When you're attached to an object, a goal, a dream or another person, there are feelings that tell you, if I don't have that, I won't be whole. So start by identifying and listing the ideas, images and expectations in your mind to which you are attached. Maybe you've listed something like this. I want to find a happy relationship. I want to be successful at work. I want to be thin and pretty. I want to spend time with my friends and family. These are pretty common goals and expectations, right? Now imagine all the ways in which these goals could go awry, even through no fault of your own. For example, you might spend years looking for a lifelong partner while only finding short-term relationships. Consequently, you will see all your shorter relationships as failures and begin to feel miserable or as there is something wrong with you. You might be fired from your job and start to question your competence. You might sustain an injury and have to spend several frustrating months in physical therapy, painstakingly returning to the same level of fitness or even less than before. These thoughts aren't particularly pleasant to consider, are they? However, the Buddha's teaching on non-attachment is ultimately about realizing the truth about yourself. You're in the cosmos, and the entire cosmos is in you, in a very real and observable way. This is because it's understood in Zen that non-attachment isn't about physical items, locations or people. It's about the ideas we occupy our minds with, what we believe about ourselves and the world around us. This process of recognizing the essential unreality of the separate, limited self is called enlightenment, and might be one of the most difficult teachings of Buddhism for sure. The Buddha also taught that it is possible not to suffer. A cessation of suffering is possible and is achieved by giving up the delusion and ignorance that fuel our attachment. This is the third noble truth, the possibility of liberation, and Buddha was a living example that this is possible in a human lifetime. The Oxford Dictionary defines detachment as a state of being objective or aloof, and therefore detachment in Buddhism is often misunderstood as a physical act of withdrawal, or even a form of austerity and if taken out of context can give the impression that we should develop a lack of concern for others and that we should live without truly feeling or expressing our emotions, even disconnecting from them, in other words, cutting ourselves off from life. But attachment doesn't happen overnight, it starts to take place after spending a good amount of time in a certain situation, or with a person like a family member, co-worker, friend or lover. We don't necessarily get attached to the situation or person itself, but rather to the experience we have with them. We get attached to the range of emotions that this particular situation or person stirs up in us, good or bad. Consequently, our mind identifies an emotion as either pleasurable or pleasant, and we crave more of it. And when attachment develops, we fear losing this person. In other words, we feel losing the emotions that they make us feel. We especially get attached to people who make us happy, because we are prone to believe that we need an outside factor to complete our sense of happiness. 
This is why detachment is important, because let's be honest, no one is happy being dependent on anyone or anything. Even if we claim that we're happy with our attachment, there will come a time when circumstances prove us wrong. Dependence on others feels good only when the causes and conditions are in our favor. But when conditions change, for example when people leave or stop being available, we realize that attachment to others causes us misery. Detaching inspired by Zen Buddhism means looking inside instead of outside ourselves to complete our happiness, and that we learn to understand that we are already complete and can achieve full happiness on our own. Any happiness coming from the outside is merely an addition to our already existing happiness, but it's not dependent on the absence or presence of the object or person. As the spiritual author Ron Rathburn wrote, true detachment isn't a separation from life, but the absolute freedom within your mind to explore living. This shift in perspective that comes when you recognize that there's no such thing as a permanent sense of happiness begins your healing from suffering. The next step is to accept that you must broaden your definition of what you need in order to be happy, giving up the habits of clinging and grasping as well as the need to control external circumstances. The final noble truth is the Buddha's prescription for the ending of suffering, but has dual meaning, suggesting either the end of suffering in this life, on earth or in the spiritual life, through achieving nirvana. When one has achieved nirvana, which is a transcendent state free from suffering and our worldly cycle of birth and rebirth, spiritual enlightenment has been reached. Attaining the end of suffering, however, is a set of principles called the Eightfold Path, or Middle Way. For further insights, please check the description box. It's important to balance a thirst for something better, with an acceptance of what is right now. Balance allows you to live in the present moment and trust that your acceptance will clear the mist of confusion and distractions and show you the way to move forward into happiness again. Here's the paradox of change. Until you can accept what is, you cannot move into what might be. After all, there's only one thing that exists, the present moment. Yet so many of us spend our days lost in the regrets of the past or worries about the future. When we cling to the past or what no longer serves us, we contract ourselves to the point where we're unable to be nourished and invigorated by the present moment. We have to accept that what has passed has truly passed in order to open up to what the present moment offers us. In the end, detaching and letting go is a state of mind, which starts with mindfulness. In Buddhism, mindfulness is more than meditation. It's a whole body and mind awareness of the present moment which allows you to observe yourself silently and watch what unfolds and arises from within you. It may be that there was something bothering you that was real in the past, and it may very well be that something could happen in the future that you will find painful. But if those things are not happening right here and right now, then they are not real right here and right now. You are creating them, and when you are able to fully appreciate that, you can let them go. Meditation offers a chance to step back and observe yourself, your thoughts and your emotions as they come and go with a spirit of non-judgment. Honing this practice is an important component of emotional regulation. You'll be able to sit with difficult emotions as they emerge, but no matter how intense they are, they will not be able to control you. It's possible to observe the moment and make a conscious choice. As you grow in your mindfulness practice, you will find yourself becoming increasingly accepting of yourself, the present moment, the nature of the world, the connection among all beings, and the impermanence of all beings. A simple truth, a major challenge. There is no three-step formula for letting go. However, consistent practice of the Buddhist path will make it much easier. Having said that, Western psychology also thoroughly acknowledges suffering. But in certain ways, it leads us to simply accepting our suffering, what Freud called our ordinary level of neurosis. Like Freud, the great existential philosophers Sartre and Camus also focus on the inevitability of our suffering. But a philosophical or psychological acceptance of normal unhappiness is a poor place to end the story, isn't it? The Four Noble Truths promise much more. They are a complete and systematic set of psychological principles and teachings that we can use to end the causes of suffering. Through their understanding, we can realize freedom. If you found value and enjoyed watching, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos.